Thank you for hanging with us. Uh, we've been in a series called Plot Twist, going through Joseph, the story of Joseph and his life. If you have your Bibles with you, open them up to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. We're going to start in verse 1. It says this, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, basically saying he's a big deal there, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. If you remember the story, right, his brother sold him as a slave to Ishmaelites. They brought him to Egypt, and now Potiphar has purchased him. And it says in verse 2, The Lord was with Joseph. Amazing that that keeps coming up in our text, right? And he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and he served him. Then he had made him overseer of all of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. And so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. So he blesses Potiphar because of Joseph being there. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for just the, the text, Lord, as we see the plot twists that are unfolding here in Joseph's life, Lord. It's amazing that it's so back and forth sometimes. He's uh, being thrown into a pit, becoming a slave. But now, Lord, it's another plot just where you're having him um, in an authority, Lord, an authority position over uh, these large possessions. But Lord, it shows us very quickly um, that you're in control. And so whatever we're going through, Lord, remind us this morning that you're in control, you're faithful, Lord. And as we are faithful to you, Father, you'll, you, you will do incredible things in our life. So thank you for the opportunity to read this text and to see about Joseph's life. But Lord, remind us that we need you every single day, daily, Lord. Remind us that we need accountability in our lives. Lord, remind us that we are literally nothing without you. Lord, speak through me today and be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Quick question for you guys. Have any of you ever been tempted before? Tempted to buy something, tempted to do something? tempted it away. I love when people are laughing. Yeah, it's like, uh, people are like, that's daily? That's daily for me, right? There's, there's def definitely temptation that comes before us. And well, I believe that temptation comes in three forms. Three forms specifically. And all of these, these forms that I'm going to mention in a second, they, we all deal with, whatever we deal with, it falls under these three things. In 1 John 2.16, it says this, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So three things, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Some of you would add a fourth and say Amazon Prime. Yes. Amazon Prime is a temptation like no other. When that happened, it was like anyone can buy anything at any moment and it showed up in your door two days later. That wasn't enough. So they came out with one day delivery. Talk about temptation on your screen at any moment in time that you can order something and it be at your door. I have a conversation with a friend often about Amazon. He calls it the devil. Um, I would agree in many aspects. And one day he sent me a picture of an Amazon, Amazon Prime truck that was delivering some boxes and he goes, look, the devil's sending out his minions to go deliver things. <laughs> Right? And the reason is why it's so funny is it really is a temptation. Raise your hand if you visit Amazon regularly and purchase things. And for some odd reason, that Amazon line and maybe your budget has increased over time. And you're spending more and more on Amazon, right? And we understand the idea of temptation. And so when we look at the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, I want to break it down as simple as we can. The flesh being that's what we feel like doing, right? It's what our fleshly desire says, I want to do this. Then you look at the lust of the eyes. That's what my senses tell me, the appearance of things, right? I see it, I want it, I like it. I, and then at times we say, I deserve it, right? I, I'm allowed to spend this money on Amazon. I'm allowed to, I want it, I worked hard for these things, right? So we see the lust of the eyes and then the pride of life, the things that we think we know. We know it all. I know how to navigate this. I know what I'm doing. God doesn't need to tell me what to do because guess what? I am God of my life, the pride of life, to say, I know it all, he knows nothing. And so these three things, if we look at them, it's like an umbrella, and every single thing that we deal with will generally fall under these three main things. So what do we do 
when one is presented to us. When one of these things is presented to us, what do we do? How do we get away? And how do we overcome it? Simple questions when you're thinking about temptation. Jesus gave us the perfect example in Luke, which we'll head to in a little bit later. But Jesus was the perfect example of how we should interact when those temptations are before us. Because Jesus himself was even tempted. When he's in the wilderness for 40 days, it said that the enemy tempted him every single day. And all of us will be in a wilderness at some point. Who would agree this morning you've been in a wilderness at some point in your life? Sitting in a wilderness, or maybe call it a desert. Or maybe just call it an area where you're just thinking, where am I? God, where are you? Well, all of us will be in a wilderness at some point. And here's the thing, it's not going to be a one-time thing. It's not a one-time thing. And many of you that have been in the wilderness before, you know this, 100%, that it was not a one-time thing. Because as you stepped out into the wilderness, and you're walking around and life continues to go on, there's another wilderness that's ahead. And so we walk in those things often. So it's not a one-time thing. And it's interesting because it could be weekly, it could be daily. On a Tuesday, we're on cloud nine. We're excited, right? Things are amazing. And then for some odd reason, we're in the wilderness, thirsty, hungry, or hangry for some of us. Yeah, hangry, all right. I know when it starts to be like 12, 15, you guys are like, stop preaching. We want to go eat. You're thirsty, you're hungry, you're desperate on Thursday. It's that quick. And it can, it can change so instantaneously. It can change literally in hours or minutes. And the enemy will strike when, guess what? You're vulnerable. Because when you're vulnerable, guess what? There's desperation, right? When you're vulnerable, you're sitting in an area where you allow the enemy to now tempt you, put those things in front of you, and it's an easy grab of temptation. If many of you have been in those uh, situations before, you'd understand, yeah, that's absolutely true. The enemy will strike when we're vulnerable. So here's the question, what will you do? What will you do when presented with one of those things in your life? If you walk away with anything today, I want, I want you to walk away with this. Temptation kills. It's death for your soul. It's death for your life. Temptation kills. At this point in our story, Joseph endured a lot. As we see, he had many brothers, and one day his, his dad sent him to go find where his brothers were. He was the only one that was at home. They were uh, 30 miles or about 50 miles away um, doing their job. And as he walked up to his brothers, what they did was they were plotting, right? Because you notice their hearts were getting hard towards their brother as he was the favorite. And we've been talking about favoritism and seeing Joseph as the favorite child of the household. So you can imagine the brothers and their heart they had toward uh, their brother being the favorite. So what did they do when they saw him? They started to scheme, how can we kill him? How can we get rid of him? So they see him, they rip him of his robe, they throw him into a pit. Then they say, we're going to leave him there and, and just let him rot there. But then they go, you know what? Instead, let's sell him as a slave. So they sold him as a slave. He ended up in Egypt as a slave. And regardless of that, here's what he did. He remained faithful the whole time. The whole time in his wilderness, he remained faithful. So he knew that God had a plan. And now what we see is he's leader over all of Potiphar, as we see the office of Pharaoh his master. He's over all of his household, all of his possessions, and was the authority in the home. So now he has this position, and it's interesting, right, when he stayed faithful, but this took time. This is something that didn't happen overnight. It wasn't something that just all of a sudden erratically changed the minute he stepped onto the scene in Egypt. No, it was probably uh, many things that took place from that time frame. We don't know. We don't see what the time frame was. But here's the interesting thing. I guarantee you, Joseph, at some point when he's being delivered into Egypt, he was tempted in many different ways. Many different ways. But he remained faithful. Because here's the thing. Maybe he's sitting in jail, right? But there's probably a temptation to run away. There's probably a temptation to break out of jail and get out of there. Right? That would be something that many of us would be thinking. It's unfair that I'm here, so I might as well break out and run away. So that temptation of freedom even in his life was there and available. But instead, he was faithful and he stood there. He chose to be faithful and endure whatever, whatever God had. And God tested him as a servant before he tested him as a leader. What are you going to do, Joseph, in this moment? 
What are you going to do? I already told you there's a plan. I gave you dreams about this. Dreams. Are you going to run away when the opportunity is there as far as him getting out of jail? Or are you going to stick around? Are you going to let me show you what I have for your life? And here's what God did. During that time, I believe God used this time to develop his character, grow him in maturity, and prepare him for leadership. Prepare him for the role that God had for his life. It was to come. It's coming. But he had to prepare him along the way. In Genesis chapter 39, again, let's continue reading. In verse 5, And so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. You see that the hand of God is over this guy's life. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. So he's basically saying, you're in charge. And he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. It's saying Joseph knew everything. He just ate, right? Now Joseph, I love this part, read it. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. See, when the Bible starts out and says that someone's good looking like this, you know there's something to come. You know there's something on the way. And in verse 7 it says this, It came to pass that after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and she said, lie with me. Now we're not going to go into detail. There's certain people in the room. Y'all get it. Y'all get it. All right? You understand. But when the Bible mentions something like this, you know what's going to happen. It says, this dude looked good. That's what it's saying. He looked good. Very simple. And so what's interesting, it says, in form and appearance. So let's just get it out there. Six pack, chisel jawline. This dude had it all, right? And so what's interesting is it shares this. And then it goes, Potiphar's wife now bluntly comes to him with longing eyes and says, Lie with me. Temptation, right? Right out of the gate. But before she says that, it says she's casting longing eyes. So what does it sound like to you? Lust of the eyes. Lust of the eyes. That's what she's dealing with. The temptation as she sees him. I see him. I long for him. So she saw him over and over again, right? If she's in the household, then she's seeing him. And as he's being raised up as a leader, there's probably times where they spent some time together. If Potiphar was with Joseph and he purchased him as a slave for him, then you know there was conversations with Potiphar and Joseph. Because he had to raise him up as a leader. So it took some time to do this. And then eventually he was over everything. So there's definitely some time that, that's in between this text to see that his wife was longing after Joseph over a period of time. And here's what it turned into as she had lust of the eyes. She saw him. She longed for him. Then it turned into lust of the flesh. I want it. I need it. So now she's acting on the lust of the flesh. And temptation occurs over time. Often it's over time that these things start to arise. The enemy knows what you struggle with. And here's the thing. He'll show you little by little. Because a, a lot of times, and um, I said this before, it's like, uh, what's that, uh, the big red dude in a bowl? Um, why am I going blank on this? Kool-Aid. Kool okay, thank you, church. You're preaching with me today. You're preaching with me today. The Kool-Aid man, the Kool-Aid man, right? Here's the interesting thing. This is not, sometimes temptation doesn't work this way. We're all of a sudden it busts through the door, and it's like, here I am! <laughs> Love that. Make sure that's recorded. <laughs> the point is, it doesn't bust through and it's like, here I am. Sometimes it does. And I always find it really interesting when you see those commercials, right? Because it's like the moms are like, yeah, this is cool. They would not be cool with the dude busting in and ruining their home. This is not reality at all. It would not happen. But the thing is, temptation, what, what happens is it sometimes doesn't bust through the door. It's little by little. And as it is shown to us, we often get closer than we may think, than we may see. Why? Because we're blinded to it. We start to get closer and closer without even realizing it. Her eyes eventually couldn't take it anymore. As you see that lust start to fill up in her mind, the, th the stuff that she started thinking about, right? 
as she sees him doing what he's doing. She couldn't take it anymore, so she reacted to the bait that was set before her. It was baited. She reacted to it. Seeing wasn't enough, so what does she say? Lie with me. Temptation kills. Temptation kills. In verse 8, it continues on. But, after she said that, he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in this house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you. Why? Because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. So the temptation in his life was presented, right? The temptation is now on her side. She's already stepping into the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. She's wanting this, right? And she's baiting him. Now he has a presentation in front of him of somebody saying, hey, let's do this thing. And he's going, no, 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 no. So what did he do? He refused. He refused. He says, your husband gave me everything that I have. He entrusted all that he has to me and everything besides you because guess what? You're his wife. And guess what I want to do? I want to respect that. I want to respect that he trusts me. He has entrusted me with everything. And I came from a slave. From nothing. He entrusted me with all these things. And now you're asking me to disrespect him. But then he goes even further. Because it's not just that. He says it's not just Potiphar. But because God put me here. God gave me all of this and he gave me this opportunity that I have. How can I do this great wickedness towards him? Why would I do this? I think in that moment, guess what Joseph understood? That temptation kills. He understood it. And he said, no. Not today. No. It's not going to happen. He says no and it, here's the interesting thing, it doesn't even stop her. So how many times do we say no to our temptation, but the temptation doesn't stop? That's hard, right? You say no, and it comes up again. You say no, and it comes up again. You say no, and it comes up again. The enemy wants to destroy you. And how many of us ran from those types of situations, the situations that bring temptation, but as you're even running away, you turn a corner, and there it is again. Anyone? It's hard. It's hard. It's not easy. And Joseph had to deal with it. It said that he said no, but it didn't stop her. In fact, in verse 10, if you read it again, it says, And so it was that she spoke to Joseph day by day. Day after day. Day after day, he, she enticed him daily, constantly being in front of him, constantly saying, lie with me. And I guarantee you, she probably tried everything to get him to do it. Day after day. Can you imagine being in his shoes? That's hard. It's hard. But he remained faithful and naturally when temptation doesn't get fulfilled, when that thing that we want, you know, doesn't happen or the things that we're desiring and it's, and it's like, we know we, we're chasing after it and it's like her, when you're thinking about her scenario and what she's thinking about, she wants it, she wants it, she wants it. But what happens when it doesn't get fulfilled? Temptation kills. In verse 11, we'll continue and it says this, but it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside. Huh, I wonder who did that. <laughs> that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying this. See, he has brought in to us a Hebrew to mock us. 
he came in to say this, to lie with me. And I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened. When he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. This woman, what is going on? Verse 16, so she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. And so it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. And so it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. Talk about plot twists all over the place in this guy's life, right? Constantly, just change after change, certain things happening. So this is what happens. She wants what she wants. She grabs him. She pulls on him. And she says, Lie with me. So again, day after day, she's bugging him. Day after day, she's asking him. Day after day, she's confronting him. Day after day, he's being tempted over and over and over again. And then eventually, she couldn't have enough. So what'd she do? She grabbed him and says, lie with me. In James chapter 1, verse 14, it says this, Temptation comes from our own desires. That's hard to hear. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to, guess what? Death. Why? Because temptation kills. That word there, entice, in the Greek it means bait or catch by bait. Enticing, right? It's no different than, is there many fishermen out there who like to fish? Anyone? Two? All right. Great. Three. Thank you. Four. Now they're coming. Five. There we go. Sweet. A couple of you like to fish. And so we understand, if maybe we've never been, or you probably understand the concept, right? You put bait on the hook, on the lure, and what do you do? You cast it out. And so as that sits in the water, what's the point? The point is that that's a bait for fish that are swimming by. And the point is that it, as it moves, it's a bait, right? And they notice it, they come around it, they take a look at it, and then eventually, what do they do? They grab a hold onto it. And now, you caught your fish. You lured them in with the bait. So what we see here, in, in James chapter 1, verse 14, it says that that temptation comes from our own desires and it entices us. So what does that mean? That bait's going to be thrown at you constantly. The enemy is going to constantly throw that bait towards you and say, do you want some? Do you want some? Do you want some? Over and over again, being tempted. And just like we see in Joseph's life, this is what was happening. So she was the first one that took the bait, right? She took the bait because the enemy was doing the same thing he's trying to do to Joseph. He did to her. He baited her. So she took the bait, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and then guess what? It turned into the pride of life. What do you mean you won't lie with me? Do you know who I am? Do you know what I've done? Do you know how long I've been here? Can't you see me? Pride. So what did she do when he didn't take the bait? She got angry. She got mad. Because she's prideful. You won't do this? All right. You'll see what happens. Pride. It stepped in. Into her life. And then you see her calling for everyone. Again. And, and now what she does is. She calls for her, her people that are around there in the house. And then ultimately going to Potiphar. And letting him know what the situation is. And ultimately he gets thrown in jail. For being faithful. How many times do you feel like you get thrown in jail for being faithful? You're being faithful and you're like, God, why is all these things happening in my life? I'm just trying to be faithful here. Why am I in the wilderness? Why am I in the desert? Why am I in jail? Why are you doing this? 
Remember, he sees the whole. We only see the now. That wilderness, that jail, might be the perfect place that you need to be in order to grow into the leader that God wants you to be. So now he's sitting in jail because of his faithfulness. Temptation grabbed him, and what did he do? He ran. He ran from it. Rightfully so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says this, if you think you are standing strong, be careful. So I had the gate, this verse. If you think you, right now, are standing strong, be careful. Be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. You hear that, church? He gives you a way out. And it's saying he'll give you, yeah, there might be this, this thing where the enemy gives you this temptation, but it says you won't be more tempted than something that you can stand. So there is a way out. So Joseph, we clearly see that he actually ran away and he found the way out. God doesn't find the way of escape for you. He makes the way of escape for you. He makes it. And he clearly made it, even for Joseph in this sake. How many of you have ever flown on a plane? Raise your hand. You've flown on a plane. I travel a lot for work, outside of this work and this job too. And so I get to travel a lot in the, in the country. So I take often, oftentimes I'm at the airport taking a flight. And here's the interesting thing that I've learned about myself over time is the pre-flight safety video. Anyone know the pre-flight safety video? Or, or yeah, they come out, they show you, this is how you buckle a seatbelt, right? And everyone's thinking like, ah, yeah, we get it. We understand, right? But, but it's so interesting because after you, you fly, or even if you don't fly often, you generally stop paying attention. Yes? Any of you that fly? Do you really listen? Okay. So we understand there's that pre-flight video and it's a safety for us, right? But there's one key part to it. There's one key part that they state in the video or that they talk about. And it's this, the emergency lights. Emergency lights. And maybe you're thinking like, I've never even heard that part. You're not paying attention. <laughs> the one key part, emergency lights. And they, and they say this, in case of an emergency... There's going to be emergency floor lights that turn on and they indicate the closest exit. Have any of you ever heard that in the pre-safety video? Okay, yeah? Some? Some be like, no. But they, they say, look, in case of an emergency, the emergency floor lights will indicate the closest exit. And just like I just asked, how many of us pay attention to these instructions? Many of you said, no. Here's what's interesting. God makes a way of escape. Lights on the floor to the nearest exit. How many of us who don't pay attention to the lights on the floor to the nearest exit are doing the same thing with God? He's turning on the lights, directing us towards the nearest exit to run away in case of an emergency, in case of temptation, but how many of us are not paying attention to his instructions? You just all agreed that you don't pay attention to the pre-safety video. But how many times are we not paying attention to the instructions God has for us as he's lighting up the way towards, guess what, victory. But instead, we got our headphones in. We're listening to a podcast or music, whatever we want, and we're not paying attention. It's quiet. It's hard stuff. Because I, I can honestly say that's been me. Where they're illuminating for a reason and God's saying, I, I've paved the way here. What are you doing? The exit's that way. And it said, we're all, all the way over here. As he's pointing you that direction. We're not paying attention. We're not listening. We're not focusing on what God has for our life. 
So temptation literally grabs Joseph by the coat. He knew what he needed to do. And what did he do? He ran away. There was a way of escape. He slipped out of the coat and he kept running. Keeping it wasn't even worth it. Keeping it wasn't worth it. So he runs. And here's what's interesting. This is the second time that Joseph's coat was taken. Second time. Joseph may have lost his coat, but he didn't lose his character. His character was more important. The will of God in his life was more important. How many of us care too much about the coat? The one thing that is holding us back from what God has. The one thing that is confining us and tempting us and grabbing a hold of us. He operated in self-control and it was so important when building his character, he was following God's will for his life. And he said, no, it ain't happening. I'll even leave my coat, my garment here and I'll run from this. And sometimes we want to hold on to the coat and by doing so, this is what happens. We step into temptation. And again, what does temptation do? It kills Temptation kills. So I want to show you something really quick. When, when you're tempted, you can say right there, thank you. When, when you're tempted, <laughs> right, it's like a lure. It's bait. It looks good. It's enticing for me. I look at that jacket and go, I want that jacket. It's a jean jacket. It's cool. I like it. I enjoy it. It's one of my favorites. And here's the interesting thing. I'm just like walking along in my life, normal life, right? Do, 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 hanging out. Cool, my wife, four kids, fifth on the way. Thank you, baby. It's amazing. And all of a sudden, temptation starts to get into my vision. Yes? You hear me? So I see it out of the corner of my eye. I can see that. I can see it there on Amazon Prime waiting for me. And then as you leave it in your cart, you get an email. Hey. We noticed you left this in your cart. Why is it so here? This looks so good. It should be on you. Oh yeah, they know what they're doing. Marketing 101 right there. Enticing you, giving you the bait. So you see this, right? You see this thing and, and here's the thing. I go, um, I mean, it's cool. I don't really need it. I want it though. It's there. But what we, what we don't understand is we start to get closer and closer and closer. And it's just dangling there. It's the bait. It's far away, but we notice it. We see it. We see that it's available. We know that it's there and it's enticing us. And so what do we do? We start to get closer and closer. Why? Because it looks good. And what happens eventually is this, is we are this close and sometimes we don't even realize it. That it's touching us. It's here. It's available. Right in front of us. And what happens is in that, in that moment where we're tempted and we finally Move into the temptation. We think we're moving in and, and we're grabbing it, but this is what it's actually doing. It's grabbing a hold of us. And now it's a part of us. And then guess what happens? So now we, we're, we're, we're covered in this temptation. It is now a part of us. And now what, what, what happens is we can't let go of it. And as we move, what does it do? I want to get away. Keeps tempting us. I want to get away. I can't get out of this. I want to get away. It's got a hold of me. How many of you been here? It's got a hold of me. Joseph, in that moment when temptation literally grabbed a hold of him, and he's probably being pulled back, as it says that she pulled him, she grabbed him, she tried to bring him in close. What did he do? The one thing he knew he could do he simply took it off and said, I don't need this. I'm going to go follow God's will for my life. This temptation, I don't need the temptation. You can keep the coat. I don't need it. The second time his coat was taken away. Don't let those things in your life, those temptations, grab a hold of you. As we know, temptation literally kills our life. We 
need to care about God's will. We need to care about what he has for our life. And here's the interesting thing about that hook. That hook on that coat, if he was pulling on that thing, he could probably take me anywhere he wanted to go, right? That's just like temptation. Once we're hooked, once we've grabbed a hold of that bait, it takes you straight into the wilderness and it'll keep you there alone. It'll keep you in the wilderness for as long as it needs to. The children of Israel, if you remember way back or, or forward from Genesis here, the children of Israel were kept in the wilderness because of their pride. God had something designed for them specifically, the promised land. But instead their pride took over and now they were sitting in the wilderness for 40 years. They didn't get to receive the blessing and the thing that was specifically designed for them. But here's what's amazing about this. Then, Jesus. Jesus. Then Jesus steps onto the scene years later. Why? Well, obviously to die for our, our, our sins. Obviously to die on the cross. But he also came for this. I love this. He had to go into the wilderness. In Luke chapter 4, verse 1, it says this, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. So our own Savior was led into the wilderness to, guess what, be tempted. To be tempted. What's so incredible about this, because you wonder, well, why? Why was he led into the wilderness, led into temptation? I believe this 100%. He came for a rematch. He came for the rematch. He said, huh, I know you got them before. And because of their pride, they get to sit in the wilderness. But I'm going to show you that it's possible. It's possible to not lean into that temptation to defeat it. So he came. He says, because... Basically, here's the understanding. In our flesh, in our human nature, we are no match for the devil in the wilderness. In our human nature, there's no match for us and the devil in the wilderness. So here's what's so amazing. Jesus showed up on our behalf. On our behalf, he showed up to the wilderness. And he says, for any of you that believe on my name and call on me in the day of trouble, I will show up. That's how faithful he is. So he shows up to the wilderness and guess what? He paid a visit to the devil. The devil thinks he's the one that showed up. No, he paid the visit to the devil. The spirit led him there to be tempted. He knew what he was doing. So he shows up. And the Bible says that he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. Tempted by, guess what? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. If you look at the story in Luke, you can see all those things as the enemy is saying to Jesus, Here's how I can tell you. Let me show you what you could have if you bowed down before me. He was tempted, but each time, and clearly said, he said, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. I'm here to show what I can do when my people are in the wilderness. There's defeat. There's defeat. He can win. So obviously he's he never gave in. He's absolutely perfect, but he paid the visit to what is tormenting us, the enemy. He paid a visit to the one thing that is tormenting you to let the enemy know that, guess what? He might be bigger than us in this room, but there's no way he's bigger than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the one that died for your sins. There's no way that he's bigger than him. So he showed up in a huge way into the wilderness knowing that he's going to be tempted because he said, not today, Satan. He's fighting on our behalf, giving us a way out of temptation at any moment that we're dealing with this. And he's showing us that it is possible, but only possible because of Jesus. Only possible because of what he did on the cross for your and I's sins. That's the only way we can defeat the devil in the wilderness. So guess what, church? Let's allow Jesus in and allow him to defeat the devil in the wilderness for us because we know there's wilderness ahead. But let the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords take care of everything for you and fight for you. That's the faithful God that we serve today. He's good. Let's stand this morning.